the triumph of the cross amid trials and tribulations. I want to talk a lot today about these trials and the purpose that God has in using trials to purify the soul. Amen? Amen. And I had an interesting experience these past couple of weeks, which actually led me to the study that we're going to be doing or having today. I had some experiences in which I had different situations that were coming upon me, which seemed one after another after another, to the point where I got overwhelmed. Unfortunately for me, I inherited this tendency to worry from my parents. I constantly worry. Not only that, it's something that I have to immediately check because when we don't check situations right when it comes upon us, it grows and it becomes bigger than you or I. And so these situations were coming upon me and of course intellectually we understand if we give it to God, he will take care of us. And so I'm praying and I'm like, Lord, I'm giving this to you, but I really wasn't because I kept talking about it. And it wasn't complaining in the sense of, Lord, why aren't you hearing me? It was more of, why isn't something being done now? And I've always been used to, and I'm sure all of us may relate to having control over things. We like situations where we can, we do what we have to do. We're the ones in control, so we're the ones who can make decisions. But when that control is in another person's hand and causes us to practice patience, it can make us very uncomfortable. And I've always been the type too, you know, I want things done, I want it done a certain way, I don't like to rely on people to do it, and I brought that experience into my religious experience. When God is saying to me, it's not about your timing, it's about mine. It's about you learning this patience that you keep asking me for. And so as I kept praying and things weren't being done quick enough, God reminded me of Elijah. He reminded me of Elijah and how Elijah had prayed for the rain for how long? For seven days. Why is it that God did not answer his prayer immediately? God wanted Elijah to search his heart and to see whether the very thing that he was asking for was for himself or for the glory of God. Oftentimes, prayers seem like they're delayed and we're in the, this situation where we feel like we're afflicted. And it's not that God is not answering our prayers, he's working it out, but it's also causing you to reflect and search your heart and say, why am I asking for this very thing? Is it for myself, Lord, or is it for you? Because we often say, Lord, may your will be done, but we really don't mean it. Not only do we not know what the will of God is, but we really want our own will to be done. We want it to be done the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it. And so when I started to reflect upon Elijah, and I really did give it to God and told God, Lord, even though you've taught me many times about worry, and I've seen your hand upon situation time after time, but now that things are coming upon me, which seems even more greater than I can bear, teach me how not to worry because I don't know how to do it. And so as I did that and I stopped talking about it, God answered one prayer and it was so divine. Have you ever had a situation where God worked it out? You knew it was God. It had to be the hand of God because even if you had answered that prayer on your own, there's no way you could have worked it out with such perfection, such order. And I was like, Lord, thank you. The next prayer had been answered. And all of a sudden I was like, Lord, you are showing me that why am I relying upon myself? Why do we look to ourselves? There's no savior there. Why do we not look to God and literally learn to leave it in his hands? That last prayer that I had has not yet been answered, but it caused me to praise God and thank him in advance for the very thing that I have asked for. And it leads us into the study today of this, these trials that come upon us, the triumph of the cross amid trials and tribulations. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15. I want us to look at the situation or the example of the Israelites. Amen? Because these are examples for us, right? Amen. In Exodus chapter 15, we see an example here where the Israelites had just been brought out of Egypt and God had just performed a miracle of parting the Red Sea. Now really think about this example where the Israelites are coming, they're trying to flee from Pharaoh and his hosts. And they come and all of a sudden they get to a point where all they see is water. There's nothing that they can see ahead of them. And they turn around and all they can see is Pharaoh and their hosts all the way trying to come up close. 
It is the most discouraging situation, but to see, wow, God has a thousand ways in which we know not one, where God parted that Red Sea and they were able to walk on dry land. And what do they do? Praising the Lord, singing. You see even here in Exodus chapter 15, in verse 20, where Miriam is there singing. Mary and Aaron, and Aaron they're there singing. They're, they're expressing their joy for what God has done. But now they're continuing on their journey. In Exodus chapter 15, in verse 22, it says, are we there? So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Let's stop right there for a second. They had three days of journeying, right? Where it says three days in the wilderness, but they come to a place where now there's no water and they begin to murmur and they begin to complain. But what happens immediately? Moses had already been in that particular area. He already knew that the water that they saw was bitter. They, Israelites, did not know that. At first they were excited, there's water. They go to drink of it, it's bitter. They begin to complain. Moses had already known. Why? Because he already passed through this experience and he knew what to do. And he did what the Israelites did not do. He prayed unto God. It says he cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. Brothers and sisters, what does a tree represent? Turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, and I want us to read in verse 39, amen? Acts chapter 10, verse 39 and 40. I want us to see what the Bible tells us a tree represents. It says in Acts 10, 39 and 40, it says, And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Who are they talking about? They're talking about Christ Jesus. What is this tree? It represents the cross. So what is Christ or God showing Moses here? He said, put this tree and cast it into the waters, which we know in Revelation 17, 15 represents people, multitudes, nations, right? Amen. Put this cross in the midst of the people and the waters were then made sweet. Many times, the waters here represent the experience of the Israelites, where they're brought into this situation where it seems hopeless. The water is bitter. What do we do? Forgetting what God has done just three days prior and complaining. And Moses was told by God, because he's the only one that did not complain and prayed, and the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Put the tree in the midst of the people. Sweeten the experience. Brothers and sisters, when we lift up the cross, when we allow it to be in the center of our lives, in the midst of our experience, we can sweeten the bitter experience. Because did not Christ drink this cup for us in Gethsemane? He drank it down to the dregs, which is the most bitter part. Does he expect us to do the same? No, it's been sweetened for us. But how is it that we make it bitter? I want to read a quotation to you. Amen. It's taken from Early Writings, page 47. It says, God has shown me that he gave his people a bitter cup to drink, to purify and cleanse them. It has a bitter drop, and they can make it still more bitter by murmuring, complaining, and repining. But those who receive it thus must have another drought, for the first does not have its designed effect upon the heart. And if the second does not affect the work, then they must have another and another until it does have its designed effect or they will be left filthy, impure in heart. I saw that this better, bitter cup can be sweetened by patience, endurance, and prayer, and that it will have its designed effect upon the hearts of those who thus receive it, and God will be honored and glorified. What is this bitter cup that we're to drink? What is it to do? Purify and cleanse us. But we make it more bitter by what? Murmuring and complaining. And what happens when we murmur and complain? 
We have to go through the same ground over and over and over, and that cup becomes more bitter every time we try to drink it. And we see here, even with the example of the Israelites, where Moses is instructed by the Lord on what to do, and he does it. But now you come, and I want us to actually think about this situation. Three days in the wilderness, and I don't want to dwell too much on this, but you have three days in the wilderness to get to this experience here. Now, before I get into that, I want to give an example of how many times in our lives God will answer prayers. He will deliver us from trials that we thought we would never overcome. And we praise him, but we forget to depend on him. God will give us this season of rest, but instead of using it to come to him, Lord, strengthen me because I know another trial will come, but strengthen me that I may be ready for it. They didn't do that. They were more focused on, you know, dancing and, and praising God, and they were not ready for what was about to come. They took their eyes off of Christ and could not find him again. And you see the example of Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph always knew where Christ was because they always needed him. Not only was he their responsibility, but he helped around the home. When, he needed chore, when they needed chores done, they would call for him. Jesus, where are you? Here, come do this, come do that. But all of a sudden, they're going on their way to this camp meeting, and they did not necessarily need him. So they were not looking for him. Conversations with other people caused them to take their eyes off of him, and they lost him. And it took three bitter days of a wilderness experience you could call it to find him and what did they do when they found him they blamed him why have you dealt with us like this do we not do that when we lose Christ because of our own failure to pray our own failure to seek him and then when we do find him Lord why have you dealt with me like this why did this come upon me Lord have I not been serving you all this time haven't I given all for you but what did you really give to God we think we give all to God when all we did was change our outfit we don't wear those things anymore. Lord, I don't eat chicken anymore. Lord, I don't eat. Wow, we've done all for God, not realizing that these things are for our own benefit. The, the food that he's asking us to eat is for our own health. The clothes that we're wearing is for our health. But we complain and act as though we just sacrificed the world for God. Because it goes on to say here in Exodus chapter 16, even after this experience, in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And they took their journey from Elam. And I want to stop there and tell you that Elam means a place of rest or strong trees. Because God was trying to bring them to this place of rest. But the word also means strong trees. What we just studied, that trees represents the cross, right? But he wanted to bring them to this place of rest. Because what, what comes after, uh, well, I won't touch on that yet. We'll go to that in a further point in the study. But they said, it says, it took them their journey from Elam. And all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. The experience that God wanted to give them. When they came to the bitter waters, where their experience should have been sweetened because of their putting Christ in the cross in the center of this experience, now God leads them to rest. This place of rest, right? Because what does the song say? At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. What happens when burdens roll away? You experience this rest, this rest of mind, this rest of soul. Brothers and sisters, I remember reading or listening to Pilgrim's Progress. And this part here helped me so much in my experience where Christian had come and he was talking about sin and how he had confessed his sins. He believed that God had truly given him repentance, but he said he felt like he still had this burden upon him, this guilt upon him. And the person that he was talking to was showing him that this guilt, once you get to the cross, will be rolled away. It will be taken off. And he was saying how, Christian was saying how it was so difficult to really understand this because it's sort of like he compared it to wearing a hat or even wearing glasses. You wear them so often you feel like even when you take it off that it's still on. Some of us have had burdens that have been so great that have been so difficult that even when God removes them, it feels like they're still upon us. And even though God has forgiven us, in our minds we feel like, Lord, have you really forgiven me? Do we look to ourselves? Do we look to our feelings? Faith is not feeling. Lord, I can't see it, I can't feel it, but your word has said it, and so I believe it. And so we have this experience here. 
In verse 2, it says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God he had, we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to, the, to fulfill. To the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They did not get it. They missed that experience that they so needed prior. They missed that experience of the cross, which should have brought them rest and strengthened them by faith. Now all they wanted to do was go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to the very thing that they had cried to God to help them be delivered from. Many times we forget how miserable we were in past situations and when trials come upon us now, we want to go back forgetting how miserable we were. Let me convince ourselves in our minds, maybe it wasn't that bad. Yeah, maybe, maybe being a slave wasn't that bad. Maybe being beaten day by day wasn't that bad. I want to go back because this trial seems oh so much to bear because we've never experienced Christ. We've never experienced Christ. And brothers and sisters, I want to read something here to you as well. Because instead of complaining, what the Israelites should have done is gathered up the fragments of their past experience. Every experience and trial is to lead you up into this ladder, but we remain stuck at the bottom because we can't seem to overcome. I wanna read where it says here, this is taken from Patriarchs and Prophets, and it is chapter 25. It says it was necessary for the Israelites to encounter difficulties and endure privations. God was bringing them from a state of degradation and fitting them to occupy an honorable place among the nations and to receive important and sacred trust. Had they possessed faith in him, in view of all that he had wrought for them, they would cheerfully have borne inconvenience, privation, and even real suffering. But they were unwilling to trust the Lord any further that they could witness the continual providence of his power. They forgot their bitter service in Egypt. They forgot the goodness and power of God displayed in their behalf in the deliverance from bondage. They forgot how God had helped them and so that their children would not have been sacrificed. They forgot how God parted the Red Sea. They saw and felt only their present inconveniences and trials. And instead of saying, God has done great things for us, whereas we were slaves, he is making of us a great nation. They talked of the hardness of the way and wondered when their weary pilgrimage would end. Instead of focusing on praising God, they focused on their current situation. And they lost the experience that was so needful to get them to, to the land of Canaan, to heaven. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand. Right, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 4, so that we can see what God wants to do when it comes to these trials. What is the point of it? 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm sure many of us are familiar with these scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Are we there? Amen. Amen. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now why is it that trials and joy are being talked about in the same scripture? Because the last thing that we think of, Sister Raquel, amen, the last thing that we think of when it comes to trials is joy. But I want us to focus on the example of Jacob. You can learn so much from the example of Jacob. Amen. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32 and see what God did for Jacob. And let's look at his experience. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 32. It says, now we all know, if we don't know the story of Jacob, we, I'll give you a little brief history where Jacob deceived his brother into giving him the birthright and as a result he then had to flee from his brother who threatened to kill him to go and stay with his uncle Laban who for 20 years he worked for and received no wages. Now 
We see in, in Genesis chapter 32, he's going back home. It says in verse one, and Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Keep your finger right there where it says angels of God met him and just turn to Genesis 31 verse three. Genesis 31 verse three, amen? amen. It says, and the Lord said unto Jacob, return unto the land of thy fathers into thy kindred and I will be with thee. This is a promise, right? God is giving him a command, but he's giving him a promise as well. Return to where you were and I will be with thee. He has physical evidence in Genesis 32 that God is with him because it says the angels of God met with him. And the spirit of prophecy says the angels of God were in the beginning of the caravan, you could call it, and at the end. He could see them. And it says in verse 2, and when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and manservants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I might find grace in thy sight. Now you see Jacob's experience here. God has told him, go, I will be with you. But this fear of Jacob has caused him to be so weighed down that he's trying to secure his own peace. He's trying to secure his own safety. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give him this. I'm gonna give him all my flocks, my manservants, my whatever he wants. And it says in verse six, and the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to my brother, thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee and four hundred men with him. Jacob couldn't go back, but he was afraid to move forward. He couldn't go back, but he was stuck. He didn't know what to do because of fear and a lack of trusting in God's promise. And it says in verse seven, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him, the flocks and the herds, again, neglecting the promise that was given in Genesis 31, verse three. And he did the same with his birthright, brothers and sisters. God promised Jacob that he would receive this birthright. And Spirit of Prophecy and Praetrox and Prophets says that he would think about this, this birthright day and night. He was obsessed with it. Not because he looked forward to it, but because he was wondering, Lord, how am I going to get this birthright? What if you don't give it to me? What can I do to secure my birthright? And here God is telling you, I will be with you. But Lord, what if you're not with me? How can I secure this safety just in case your word fails? Constantly trying to make provision in case God's word does not come to pass. And it says, going on in verse 11, Deliver me, I pray thee. This is, this is Jacob praying. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. This is a prayer of self. We often do not use God's words in prayer. Lord, I'm scared. Help me. Help me. Deliver me instead of, Lord, give me grace to overcome this situation. And in going on, we see that in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Brothers and sisters, I always would read this chapter, and I was very confused when it came to this part because I always wondered how is it that Jacob is wrestling with a man, but he doesn't recognize that it's God. It, it, I didn't quite understand it. I understood the outcome, but I didn't understand that part. And it was an experience that got me to understand that Jacob was wrestling against himself. It was the flesh. Because doesn't God say we wrestle not against flesh and blood? but principalities. So he did not recognize God's hand that had orchestrated this whole situation and he was praying against it. He thought it was an enemy. We often pray, Lord, give me peace. Give me uh, uh, patience. Help me with this. And when God orchestrates those things so that you can receive it, we complain, this is not God. This is Satan. Satan is trying to destroy me. Lord, deliver me. We're not recognizing that God is answering our prayer. And so he thought he was wrestling against an enemy not realizing that this is the hand of God. And it says, and he said, let me go. This is verse 26, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. 
And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. His name was changed. Why? Because he wrestled with God. Not against God. He wrestled with him until the break of day. He wrestled with him until he obtained this experience that he had not received prior to. That's why it was so difficult. And you know, I often think about, and this is my own thinking, I often think about the time of trouble. And I have read about how many will be put in prison, some will be slaves, some will find refuge in mountains. And I, in this situation, even this pa the past week or so that I've been going through, what really caused me to open my eyes and really give everything to God through his help and faith in his word was saying, wow, how do I know that I will not needlessly have to be in a more difficult situation in the end because I failed to overcome smaller trials now? And it became so much bigger, just like we just read, the cup becomes more bitter, more bitter. We have to go through it over and over and place ourselves in a situation in the end that we could have avoided had we not just pleaded with God till the break of day to overcome. Because what is the scripture in Psalm 30? Let's go to Psalm chapter 30. Amen? Amen? Psalm 30, and I want us to read in verse 5. Amen? Amen? He was wrestling with God rather than bringing in faith, brothers and sisters. And he was wounded at the end, but he still overcame. Christ was wounded in Gethsemane and in, during the whole experience with the cross, but he overcame, right? And so in this experience here in Psalm 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, brothers and sisters, wrestling with God, staying up if you have to until the break of day when you're able to receive this joy. How is it that Jacob received this joy? Through perseverance. How did Christ receive that joy? Because where did he have weeping? The Garden of Gethsemane, where he was sweating drops of blood. He had no one there to help him. And actually, coming to my mind, 2 Timothy, let's go there really quick. You can keep your finger in Genesis, but in 2 Timothy, amen? amen. I want us to read a precious promise that God has for us. 2 Timothy, and I want us to turn to verse... Verse, chapter 4 and verse 16. There is no experience that you have that Christ has not gone through. There is no experience that you have that God is now with you. It is during your darkest hours that Christ is most near to you. Because you cannot feel him or see him. Christ on that cross could not see or feel God the Father, but he suffered with his son. The angels, there were no angels in heaven when he was upon that cross. They were all there with him. Heaven, all of heaven has an interest in our salvation, more than you or I for our own selves. God is more willing to send all the host of heaven to help you overcome one trial rather than see you be overcome. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, it says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray that God it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. We may not have anyone on this earth that can relate to our trials and sufferings and sorrows, but we don't need that. We often hear people say, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand my situation. You don't need to understand that situation. Yes, it's nice to have someone who can relate, but when you have no friend, no family member who could even care, or someone that you can depend upon to pray, everybody says, I'll pray for you. I don't believe that. People say it, it's lip service. When you are in need, you know who to call for prayer. People who never call you will call you when they need prayer. They may not care for your company, but they know when they know a man or woman of God. So notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Who stood with Jesus? Who was there with him in Gethsemane? God had to send an angel to come and strengthen him because there was no man that could do it for him. 
and took his face and brought him to look at heaven to open up this scene that would took place in the end and which this sacrifice would be accepted even if it was just one person it was enough for him this sacrifice would be accepted and it was enough for him to continue on but this weeping endured for that night but joy came in the morning and as I was thinking upon that I'm like Lord how is it that joy came for Christ after Gethsemane it was at the cross but we don't look at the cross as a source of of joy do we and I want us to turn in our books or Bibles to Revelation chapter 12 amen, amen. Revelation chapter 12 it's interesting how Jacob recognized he had been fighting God all along during the night and his grasp of resistance became a grasp of faith, brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 12. And I want us to read in verse 10 through 12. How is it that this joy came in the morning for Christ? Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 through 12. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, We all there? Amen. Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. When did this take place? When was the accuser cast down? When did God gain this victory? At the cross. At the cross. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Rejoice at the cross. It's not a time of sorrow. You know, the disciples missed it. They completely missed it. What did Christ tell them in the Garden of Gethsemane? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. They missed it. The bitter waters were too much for them. And they did not pray. And as a result, they fled at Gethsemane they fled at the cross even when Jesus resurrected they thought it was a ghost Lord have mercy they failed to obtain their experience and it wasn't until afterwards but imagine what they could have done prior to imagine the souls that could have been won imagine the glory that God could have received if his own disciples had been strengthened in the Lord if their own disciples had received the experience that they needed, it would have been a different outcome, brothers and sisters. This experience of Jacob and this experience of Christ. Weeping endures for the night, but this joy cometh in the morning. And I want you to write three things that has to deal with this joy. It is the birth, uh, studying specifically the birth and incarnation of Christ, studying the truth of the cross, and studying the power of the resurrection. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter two. The first one is studying the incarnation or the birth of Christ. His death is number two, and his resurrection is number three. But we will repeat them. Luke chapter two, verses 10 through 12, amen? amen. And Luke chapter two, verse 10 through 12. In all his trials, brothers and sisters, Christ's life brought joy. Remember when in the fullness of time Christ came and in John one, it says he came to his own and his own received him not. Not only did the people not receive Christ, they weren't even searching for him. Luke chapter two, verses 10 through 12, amen? And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The birth of Christ, brothers and sisters, it fulfills the prophecy that the Messiah would not only be born, but it also is parallel to the second coming. There's joy, it says here. And the angel says, I bring you good tidings of great joy. It was not joy to the people then, and it is not joy to the people now. When people think about the coming of Christ, don't, don't get it twisted. Just because people are saying, oh yeah, Jesus is coming, it's fear. Fear that takes them. They're not ready for Christ's coming. Everything they hear on the news, people, oh no, the Pope, the Pope just said that, did you, the Pope said. But we know that these things are to come. Are we ready spiritually? Fear will not overtake you if you are prepared. Fear of your life, fear, it, these things, God is preparing us. Just like we've studied the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't something that just that day, oh, okay, let me be ready for the Sabbath. Let me be kidding. No, it's a preparation that begins the first day of the week. And by Sabbath, you're ready to re meet him. 
It's a work in the heart. So this joy, and also the truth, what about the cross? How does that bring joy? It cleanses us from sin. At the cross is where you have this light. At the cross is where we receive this rest. At the cross is where you receive victory over sin. At the cross is when Christ overcame, went to heaven, and was able to get all power to give us, to overcome every sin that so easily besets us. We have power through the cross. And even in through the resurrection, it gives us what? Power to live. We receive this newness of life, brothers and sisters. But failing to watch and pray, failing to have this experience, failing to lift up Christ, not just in the midst of the people in general, in the midst of the church. You don't hear this anymore. You don't hear about the power of the, of the cross giving us the power to overcome sin. The most you will hear is do your best. That is the most you will hear. And you have people, even as myself, where I used to hear these messages and I'm saying, why would God give us this book of instruction and just tell us to do our best? Why do we need these promises? I couldn't see one person doing it. And it was so discouraging because I'm being convicted of what is right and wrong, but then why would I be convicted without having the power? God never gives you or brings you to a problem without giving you the solution. When the Israelites came to the bitter waters, was there not a solution? It was prayer. Moses already had this experience and knew exactly what to do. The Israelites missed it. The disciples missed it. And many of us today miss it because we are constantly complaining about the littlest things that have nothing to do with anything. These trials are so light compared to the eternal glory that will be given to us in the end. We don't talk of heaven as much as we talk of trials. People are not as excited for these things. I remember a pastor that was preaching not, uh, not too long ago where he said, you know, that is when his wife would go away on vacation, the children were so excited for her to come, and every day all they could talk about was their mom. I can't wait for mom to come home. You think mom's gonna like this when she comes? Look, I drew this for mom. It was mom, 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 to the point where it was like, man, all they talk about is their mother. I, you know, but they were ready for her to come back. We don't do that. If we were really ready for Christ, our conversations would be more of heaven and less of self. Yes, trials come. Are they exciting and fun? No, but it should bring us joy in knowing that it's working out for us something that we, once we achieve, it becomes easier. It becomes easier. Just like exercise, it becomes easier the more that we do it. Amen? Amen. And everything has its order, brothers and sisters. We cannot receive the crown without the cross. We have this order, this wilderness experience, which I'm not going to deal with, but dealing even with appetite, which prepared cross for Gethsemane, which prepared him to go to the cross, which prepared him for this resurrection. There's an order to things, but we just want that resurrection experience. The angel's message has an order. You cannot overcome the mark of the beast if you have not received the gospel, which is the first angel's message. There's an order to things. And God has given us instruction. I want to read, I want to read a quotation here. Amen? Amen. It says, and this is in Historical Sketches, page 146. We're coming to a close. I just have a few quotations and then we will close. It says, many attend religious meetings, receive instruction from the servants of God, and are greatly refreshed and blessed. And yet because they do not feel the necessity of praying and watching thereunto on the homeward journey, they return to their homes no better than when they left them. I, I, I mention this in almost every message I have. We have no experience with God, and the only thing we can cling to is a future camp meeting. We're so excited for camp meetings as though that's going to somehow resurrect an experience in us. And it can, but why is it that we don't have an experience to bring into the camp meetings or into these convocations or these week of prayers? It's because on the homeward journey, we've neglected and left Christ there. We talk it away. We do not plead until we resist the very thing that God convicted us of. And we always confuse conviction with conversion. And we compare ourselves with each other. Well, I know that this is wrong. Therefore, I'm in a position that you're not. I'm better than you. We don't say that, but we feel that way. We think we have a right to heaven because we've intellectually accepted the Sabbath. Or we've changed our outward appearance. It goes on to say, as they realize their loss, 
They frequently feel inclined to complain of others or to murmur against God, but do not reproach themselves as the cause of their own darkness and sufferings of mind. These should not reflect upon others. The fault is in themselves. They have talked and jested and visited until they grieved away the heavenly guests, and they have only themselves to blame. It is the privilege of all to retain Jesus with them. If they do this, their words must be select, seasoned with grace, and the thoughts of their hearts must be disciplined to dwell upon heavenly things. I remember a time there was a pastor that came to preach. This is the first I've never heard a man speak with such power. And I was so convicted and I brought, some, I brought a lot of people with me. There was one specific person that um, was struggling at the time and she came, she heard the message and we were just both like, you know, all we wanted to do was go home and pray. And that pastor gave a specific announcement when he was done. I never heard a pastor say this before. He said, I want everyone to leave here silently. Do not speak. Do not allow your convictions to be taken away by the enemy. And in my mind, I was like, okay, well, I just want to go home and pray. So I leave with this person, and as we leave, there were people there who wanted to talk about the fact that this was a self-supporting minister and that we shouldn't be going there. And the conversation was so much, and they're asking her questions, and she was new in the faith. She was kind of, she didn't know what to say, so she was, you know, answering here and there. And, and I was convicted to be quiet, but we often think, we convince ourselves that we're fanatical. We don't want to seem like we're better than people. And so instead of me saying, I'm sorry, I have to leave, I was talking. And by the time I left, I had lost the conviction, it wasn't as strong. And I remember the girl that was with me was so quiet, and she said to me, Maria, I... <laughs> Maria, I really wish that I hadn't spoken. And I'm just crying because you know, you, you realize the power that you have over souls and how many can be lost because of the things that you say, that you're not prayerful. She said, I really wish that nobody had spoken. I really wish that people had just listened to what that pastor said. I wouldn't have lost my experience. She's like, because I, I don't even remember what was spoken. And that was one of the last times that she really came to church. And I'm saying this because there's a power in the counsels that we have. There's a power in the reason that God tells us the instructions that he gives us, thank you. It's not because of any other reason than to win our hearts to Christ we talk it away and it says these should not reflect upon others the fault is in themselves it is the privilege of all to retain Jesus with them if they do this their words must be select seasoned with grace and I want to read another quotation that goes right along with it let us here resolve that we will not sin against God with our lips that we will never speak in a light and trifling manner, that we will never murmur or complain at the providence of God, and that we will not become accusers of our brethren. We cannot always hinder the thoughts that come as temptations, but we can resist the enemy so that we shall not utter them. Don't talk about them. It's one thing if you need counsel and you want to come to, you know, pastor or someone that you trust who's in the faith and you need counsel, but just to talk, Oftentimes we do not want any counsel. We want someone to agree with us. And I've noticed a big difference also between men and women. Women, not just women, but I've noticed, women love to just talk. They want to just pour their souls out. And when someone gives them counsel, oh no, there's a, there, I remember one individual who had called me and she was telling me about her situation and there's no way that she couldn't have seen the answer to her problem. She was basically telling me she was involved in a relationship with this individual who was into sorcery, went to witchcraft, um, there were strange things happening in the home, she was living there, and she wanted me to pray. And I said, I can pray, but I believe that God has already shown you that you need to leave. Well, I just want you to pray for him. You know, I can't leave because I'm not working. Well, you can always get a job. Well, I can't be, well, you know, I have a daughter. Well, you know, maybe you can leave your daughter you know, with a, uh, someone that you trust. Well, there was always an excuse. People are to a point where they don't want counsel. They want God to agree with their plans. They don't want to know what the will of God is. They just want someone to be in agreement with them. They don't want to hear counsel. They want to complain and talk about their feelings. Brothers and sisters, says, don't talk about them. Come to God. Give it to him. He will show you exactly what needs to be done. It says, the adversary of souls is not permitted to read the thoughts of men, but he is a keen observer, and he marks the words and actions, and skillfully adapts his temptations accordingly. If all would labor to repress sinful thoughts and feelings, giving them no expression in words or acts, 
Satan would be defeated, for he would not know how to prepare his specious temptations to meet their cases. That is powerful to me. Satan cannot read your thoughts, but by the things that you say, he can see where you are and prepare his trap for you. But when you don't give utterance to those discouragements, when you don't give utterance to those things that are coming upon you, he gets confused. He does not know what to do, especially when you have a legion of angels that are surrounding you in heaven, protecting you. Amen. It says, this is in Review and Herald, June 20th, 1907. When trials come, as it will, do not worry or complain. And listen to this, it says, silence in the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Oftentimes we do not hear the very thing we need to hear because we're busy talking. We're busy complaining instead of listening to that small, still voice, that, that salvation that comes through rest and quietness. Being still and knowing that he is God. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. He is guiding you into a harbor of gracious experience. And he bids you be still and know that I am God. And again, I am not saying that we are not to talk to each other about things that are happening. That can be very important because a godly friend can give you counsel that no other person can. God can use individuals, but oftentimes, more so, God is saying, come, come to me. Hear my voice. Learn to hear my voice. Learn to hear what I have to say. I have a couple of more and we're done. It says, do not think, this is taken from manuscript, manuscript releases 4, page 159. Do not think that because you have made mistakes, you must always be under condemnation, for this is not necessary. Do not permit the truth to be depreciated before your mind, because those who profess it do not live consistent lives. I wanted to read this specifically because I know that in my experience, and many people, they end up leaving the fake because of other people. Whether it's because they seem hypocritical or whatever the case is, don't look upon them. Now, this is not talking about going and listening to Arrow or watered down messages. This is about looking at the individuals in the congregation and saying, why are they doing this? Why are they saying that? Look how they were so high, now they've fallen. I don't want to be around that. Why can't you be that example? You know, so many people are waiting for someone else to step up and do something. We're waiting for this camp meeting. We're waiting for someone else. And as soon as we hear this powerful message, I want what they have. Why can't you strive to be that person? Why can't you strive to, to, to make that step in your life, brothers and sisters? People are watching you. People are watching you. It says, how foolish, and, and, and even dealing with darkness in our lives, where she's basically talking about how foolish it would be to basically go in a basement and complain about how dark it is. When all you have to do is go upstairs where there is light, right? Come up higher. Yes, there will be darkness, brothers and sisters, but we can choose to go to where the light is. Again, don't look to yourself. There is no savior within you. Look to Christ Jesus. It says discouragement, discouragement and gloom come upon us, not because the truth is not sufficient for us, but because we do not bring it to our hearts and let it have a controlling influence over our lives and actions. Your peace, your rest, comes in wearing Christ's yoke. You have the peace of Christ, and your conscience is not continually scourging you because you have not committed yourself to do the will of God. Do you know why people's conscience are always bothering them? I don't care who it is. I've known individuals who have left the church, and it's been years, and they have told me, even when I was in the world, my conscience would not let me rest. I was always aware of the fact that I was not right with God. When you receive that peace and knowing I am right with God, your conscience is finally at rest. You don't have to worry about your life, losing your life. Or oh, what if I don't get this job? How am I going to pay the bills? All of these things come in a train as we receive the Holy Spirit, which brings us this rest, which brings us this peace of mind. Amen? Amen? If you look to yourself, you will only see weakness. Turn away from yourself, brothers and sisters. We have to come to a point where we realize that our lives, are we are here before a short time. I mean, even not that long ago, a young Seventh-day Adventist 
um, man who died at the age of 25 from a heart condition. People are passing left and right and we think we, we don't even know if we have this hour. We don't know if we are even ready and we don't know. We're not preparing to meet Christ. And there are so many individuals that are looking to us to show them something and we don't have that burden. We just rejoice in the fact that, oh, they want to have a Bible study, but we don't want to bring them all the way. We don't know how to bring them all the way. It seems to be like a burden for us and we're constantly just complaining. People are hearing you. People are watching you. In your home is where it begins. We want to go out and do ministry work, but the people in your home are looking upon you, whether it's your father or your mother or your children. If your home is not right, brothers and sisters, how are we going to be able to overcome these greater obstacles? How can we reach the world if we haven't reached those right in our home? This is where it begins. The Spirit of Prophecy talks about it often. We want to do missionary work. I want to go to you know, Africa. I want to go here. I want to go there. But yet the people in your own home are looking upon you as though you're a hypocrite. People in your home that are not a Christian, that have heard of Christ, but the only thing that they've seen of Christ is you and your sorry example of a Christian. It is so sad, brothers and sisters, and we need to pray. We really need to ask God to sweeten this experience, to give us, brothers of the song, Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee, even though it be a cross that raises me. This cross is what will give us this experience where we are risen. This cross, even though cross we associate it with trials. No, with the cross comes this power of life. With the cross comes this salvation. It's where we lay our burdens down. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. We sing these songs and we're so phony. We're not even thinking about the words. We're just singing it because, hey, this is what we do. It hasn't been an experience for us. So what is there that we have to give to the world? Nothing. Oh, brothers and sisters, when Jacob's time of trouble comes, it'll be too late. It's not like you can drop a seed in the ground and then say, oh, where's my fruit? Where's my vegetable? It doesn't work that way. Every day there's a grooming process and we have to wait for it daily. God is waiting for us. We think, oh, we're waiting on God. No, brothers and sisters, he's waiting for you. He's waiting to get this fruit. And God forbid he should utter those words. Cast it down. Why cumber it the ground? Cast it down. And we continue to pray spirit this year also. May Lord have mercy upon our souls. Amen. Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what more can you do for your vineyard? You have given us so much. You have given us Christ. You have given us the angels, prayer, promises. These messages that are for today. And yet every day, many of us just turn away and we say, I'll wait for a more convenient season. And Lord, there will never be a more convenient season. Help us to not turn our hearts from thee. But even today, if we hear your voice, help us to answer you. For you have given us such promises that you will help us. You will strengthen us. You will uphold us with the right hand of your righteousness. You will be with us, notwithstanding that we have no one else in this world who may be praying for us. But Lord, you are with us. Help us to have this Gethsemane experience and learn to surrender our will to you. Help us that even though this weeping may endure for a night, that we may receive this joy in the morning, that this cup may be sweetened because you have already drank it for us, Lord. You have already walked this path and you've made it easier for us. And I pray that all of us may be standing on that sea of glass saying, wow, heaven is cheap enough. Where we will go, we will not have to try and think of the greatest trials because they will be so insignificant to us. But we have testimonies to share when we go to all the other parts of this world and we visit other people. We may have an experience to give them and we may be able to honor Christ Jesus. Where we will be able to lay down our crowns at his feet and say, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of this earth. 
Thank you, God, but help us to learn how to perfect praise here on earth. For if we are to be saints in heaven, it must begin here on earth. Help us, dear God, that we may not be a castaway. You say, those that come into you will in no wise cast out. Our prayer is that we may be converted unto thee. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.